A hundred points. I slide across the seat of Ethan's truck to make room for Alice. We are picking her up from her community project before we head back to the village charter. We're outside the offices and labs adjacent to the Del Oro University Medical Center. Besides coming here for therapy, she also volunteers for the Del Oro Ethics Task Force. She gathers materials for review and helps process the numerous checks and balances that monitor their research activities. Grunt work. Ethan called it when he described it to me. How could it be any more grunt work than spooning dirt? And I remember the way Alice spoke of it a few days ago. It's important to her. She's passionate, and I think she would do it even if Ray did not require a community volunteer project. She's accepted the loss of her limbs, but blames an out-of-control medical system for the outcome. She thinks if someone had regulated antibiotics long ago. When they first knew about the dangers of overuse, she and millions like her would have had a different fate. Now she seems determined that no new medical injustices will be unleashed on the world. When he talks about Alice, Ethan's voice takes on an edge I hadn't heard before, like he feels her injustices too. Does he care about her? How much does he care? Or does he have injustices of his own? I know nothing about him really. Why is he at the village charter? Ethan said they all had their reasons for being there. Alice talked about her physical limitations. Gabriel said he had an anxiety disorder and the small environment was more comfortable for him. But Ethan never revealed his reasons. Can you take these? Alice hands me the braces that still steady her, and she slides in next to me. Two more weeks, and these will be gone. At least that's what they tell me. Her eyes sparkle, and her words come out in a continuous, excited stream. They uploaded some new technology that will help the prosthetics anticipate my own balance system. It will supposedly read nerve signals from my brain and learn from them. They said to walk as much as possible to speed up the learning process. Imagine that! I've got smart legs. She shoots a warning look at Ethan. Don't say a word. Me, Ethan says sweetly. I thought you were here for your volunteer project. I say, that too. But the therapy and the ethics offices are in the same complex, so I get it all done the same days. How's your project go? Shoveling dirt. She's a horse, Ethan says, repeating his assessment of me. I liked it. I tell her, it's not exactly a mental challenge. Well. Except maybe for Ethan, but Father Rico was very grateful. Ethan jogs the steering wheel to register my point, and Alice laughs. <laughs> the mission's a good cause. They don't have funds, so without volunteers, they'd never be able to keep it up. It has a lot of history that's important. It was my second choice, right after the ethics office. Who runs the ethics office? The hospital? I ask. Are you kidding? The hospital hates the ethics office, but they'd never admit it. You've never heard of the FSEB? I try to scan my pathetic excuse of memory. It seems like I should know it, like it's almost within my reach. It's not another bad word, if that's what you're thinking, Ethan says. It's the Federal Science Ethics Board, Alice says. They run the office. They're the yay and nay of all research, and a lot of medical procedures too. If you don't file all the forms and report every procedure, they shut you down. Whole hospitals. They've actually done it. Not often, but enough times that it's put the fear into every medical and research facility in the country. Why do they do it? They're the watchdog. There has to be some central control. Look at human cloning at the turn of the century. Even though it was illegal, some lab facilities were still doing it because the checks and balances were so weak. And then there's biogel. That alone is probably responsible for Congress even establishing the FSEB. Alice is still talking, but it's a garbled echo. Biogel, father's work. I can hear Lily saying it again. He made a big splash. Biogel. 
It changed everything. It made almost anything possible. What do you mean? I ask. Alice raises her eyebrows. You do have big blanks, don't you? Well, blue goo, as the hospital calls it, is well blue. Brilliant, Ethan interjects. And Alice says, raising her voice. It's artificially oxygenated and loaded with neurochips. They're smaller than the human cell and communicate with each other pretty much the same way neurons do, except faster. And they learn. Once you've loaded them with some basic information, they pass on information to other neurochips and begin to specialize. And of course, the truly spectacular thing is they can communicate with human cells in the same way. You pack a human or lab liver in biogel, and the neurochips do the rest: deliver oxygen, nutrients, communicate with the central database, until it can be transplanted into someone who needs it. Isn't that a good thing? Sometimes, but just because we can doesn't mean we should. That's what the FSEB considers. How so? I ask, trying to sound only mildly interested. Well, one way is point values, she says. Everyone gets a lifetime maximum of one hundred points. My limbs, for instance. The implanted digital technology to work with the prosthetics is very low point value, sixteen points for all of them. But a heart, that's worth thirty-five alone. Throw in lungs and kidneys, and you're at ninety-five points. That sounds simplistic, I say. Maybe, but fair too. It doesn't matter how rich or important you are. Everyone's in the same boat, and medical resources and costs are kept under control. What about brains? Ethan asks. What are they worth? Brains are pretty much illegal. Only biodigital enhancement up to forty-nine percent is allowed to restore some lost function, and that's it. That's an odd number, I say. Why only forty-nine percent? You have to draw the line somewhere, don't you? Medical costs are a terrible economic drain on society, not to mention all the ethics involved. And by restricting how much can be replaced or enhanced, the FSEB knows you are more human than lab creation. We don't want a lot of half-human lab pets crawling all around the world, do we? I think that's the main point of it all. And the FSEB is always right, Ethan asks. Alice sits up straighter, and her words come fast and clipped. They're trying to preserve our humanity, Ethan. How can anyone argue with that? They're protecting us, and I, for one, think that is quite admirable. Plus, I happen to know there's a lot of very intelligent and qualified people in that agency. Ethan pulls into the parking lot at the charter. All I know is that a lot of intelligent and qualified people screwed up my life two years ago. He throws the gear into park. So much for intelligence, huh? It seems our conversation has taken a sudden turn that I wasn't expecting. Ethan's voice is rigid, like the day I called us all freaks at the market. He leaves to go into the charter, not waiting for us. Alice lets out a huff of air. He can really go off sometimes. She rolls her eyes and reaches for her braces. I watch him walk away, wondering if his life changed just about the same time mine did. And like me, he's still getting over it, though I don't know what the it is, and I'm afraid to ask. But I'm sure it's why he's at the charter now. I wait outside for Ethan to take me home. I've already conferenced with Ray, and now Ethan's conference is going over. Hello, Dane surprises me from behind. I haven't talked to him much since that first day. He's been out. Ray didn't say why, and Mitch only groaned when Alice asked, "How are things going?" His voice is warm and eager, and I like the sound of it. But I also remember what Ethan said about him. Good, I answer. Like your project? Yes. Need a ride? No. He blows out a very heavy breath, obviously annoyed at my short responses. He swings around in front of me and grabs my hand. 
Come on, has Ethan been saying bad things about me? You're not going to listen to him, are you? His hand is warm, firmly clasped around mine. I look up and I'm surprised at how closely his eyes match the color of the sky behind him. I have a problem, he says. I admit it. I'm honest. Like when I said you walked funny? I don't think any less of you because you do, and I didn't mean anything bad by it. You're not going to hold that against me, are you? No. He loosens his grip on my hand, but I notice he doesn't let go. We all have our problems, and Ethan's is he can't deal with the truth. He can't even tell the truth. I'd stay away from him if I were you, but I guess you'll figure that out on your own. You're obviously smart. He smiles, but it doesn't mesmerize me like the day I first saw him at his house. I'm changing daily. I can see things in faces that I couldn't see just a few days ago. Things that I think other people can't even see. And what I see in Dane's perfectly beautiful face disturbs me. Emptiness. The word is strong in my head, and yet I wonder if it could be the wrong one. Friends? He asks. Friends. That's why I wanted to come to school in the first place. Maybe Dane had friends like I once did. Friends who are gone now. And he misses them the way I miss Kara and Locke. Friends. I repeat because I know it would be rude not to. And because I think, maybe. Maybe. Then I'll stop by sometime, since I live just down the street, he says as he walks away. Sure. Thanks for the invite, neighbor, he calls over his shoulder. Did I invite him? Contents Empty Adjective 1. Containing nothing, having none of the usual or appropriate contents. 2. Vacant, unoccupied. 3. Destitute of some quality or qualities. Now, a day later, I wonder what friends means to Dane. I wonder at his voice that is so different from his eyes. I wonder if I know anything at all. But I do know this. The word I felt when I looked into his face was the right word. Home. The house is empty. Saturdays are empty, I decide. There's no banging, no restoration, no school, no anything. Mother left early in the morning. She didn't tell me where she was going, but asked me to stay close by. I wanted to say no, but I didn't. Lily's been out in her greenhouse all morning. She didn't invite me to join her. I wouldn't want to anyway. I've looked out my bedroom window twice, trying to see what she's doing, but most of the inside of the greenhouse is out of view. I don't care what she's doing. I lie back on my bed and look at the ceiling. A Cotswold ceiling is fairly uneventful. It matches me. Mother and Lily don't know, but Father was right. My memory is coming back. It's curious how it comes. Each day, a rush of pieces, loosely connected, unimportant bits, snake through me. They click, click, click into my brain, like links being snapped together. And then they are done a small chain of memories that fill in one tiny part of my life. They come out of nowhere, and most are not important. I remember shopping for socks, feeling the socks, paying for the socks, looking at the receipt for the socks. Every detail of a sock shopping outing that happened five years ago. Who cares about socks? But then others, those come out of nowhere too. Last night in the hallway. I was dizzy with the rush of this memory. I had to lean against the wall in the dark and close my eyes. It was so clear. I was sobbing, screaming for mother. I saw her crying, a tear briefly before she walked away. I cried for her to come back. I tried to reach out for her, but father held me back. No, he held me. I was a toddler. Maybe... Eighteen months old. I wore a bright red coat, 
father a black one. He kissed my cheek, wiped my tears, promised she would return. I kicked my feet. He held me tighter. I remember it like it was yesterday. How can I remember this? If I have to remember a lifetime of memories, bits at a time, will it take me another whole lifetime to reclaim them all? Or one day will they all connect up and explode inside of me? I peek out my window again. No sign of Lily. The floor creaks beneath my feet. I walk to the other upstairs rooms. They're all still empty. Will Claire ever fill them? But with what? With only me? I go downstairs. I've never really properly explored the downstairs rooms. Other than a hurried rush to Claire's bathroom when I cut my knee, I've never spent any time in the rooms beyond the hallway. It only just now strikes me as odd that I've been like a house guest, confining myself to my room and the shared rooms only, never feeling free to roam the rest of the house. Stay close by, Jenna. I am. I go to the first doorway on the right in the downstairs hallway. Lily's room, I think. I push open the door, but it's an office. Claire's office, by the looks of the blueprints, fabric samples, and design books. It's cluttered and disorganized. Not what I would expect of Claire. I move to the next doorway on the right. I turn the knob. The hinges squeal, startling me. Mother has still not updated the hardware and keys of the house. Maybe she thinks it makes the Cotswold more authentic, but it makes moving about unnoticed much more of a challenge. I find a large room, simply furnished. Yes, Lily's room. A pair of her shoes sits neatly in the corner. On the bureau is a scattering of framed pictures. Claire, my grandfather and Lily, and another one of a little girl in a pink party dress and black shiny shoes. A little girl who holds Lily's hand. The little girl Lily loved. I walk over and lay it face down. So what if she knows? What can she do, hate me? I feel empowered and I kick her shoes out of alignment. And I'm amazed that such a small action could feel so good. Enough of Lily's room for one day. The next door on the left side of the hallway is locked. I move on to Claire's room. The master suite is large. Adjoining the bedroom is a sitting area furnished with two overstuffed chairs and a small library. An arched doorway on the other side of the bedroom leads to a dressing area, closets, and a bathroom. The closets form the same odd tunneling arrangement as mine does. Multiple closets for different needs. Overkill. The largest closet has another door at the back of it that leads toward the center of the house, so I know it would be a windowless room. I put my ear to the door and hear something. A faint hum. I jiggle the lever, but it's firmly locked. The mattress. 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 I walk to Claire's bed, throw back the bottom corner of the spread, and slide my hand beneath the mattress. I pull out my hand and try another corner. It is there. A key. I grab it and stand. For once, I remember something about Claire that is useful. What are you doing? I slip my hand into my pocket. Nothing? Looks like something to me. I look at the ruffled corners. I was just straightening Claire's bed. She left it unmade. There's nothing else to do around here. Lily looks into my eyes, like she's searching for something. I finger the key in my pocket, and she watches but doesn't say anything except, There's someone outside looking for you. I find Ethan on the front walkway. He shifts awkwardly and then smiles. He almost looks like he's in pain. Hello, he says. Hello. I look at him and wait, wondering what I'm supposed to do. Oh, he reaches into his jeans pocket and his strange smile vanishes. I, I found these keys in my truck. I thought they might be yours. He holds out a ring with two card keys dangling from it. No, not mine. Oh, he doesn't move. Maybe they're Alice's, I offer. Maybe. He shoves the keys back into his pocket and the painful smile returns. I'll see you on Monday then. Your smile is so fake, I say. You need more practice. 
His brows come together, and he snorts like he's offended. And of course, you're the expert on smiles. Anything you don't know? Not much, I smile, large and sustained. He shakes his head and looks sideways at me. You win. I can't beat that. I ask him if he'd like a tour, and he says yes. He has nothing better to do. Nothing better? Yes, definitely Mr. Personality. He seems interested in the new walkway the workers have laid, and also in the dismantling and rebuilding of our chimney. When we walk around to the back, I see that Lily has returned to her greenhouse. I feel the key in my pocket. I could ask him to leave. This might be my only chance to be alone in the house for a long while, but I don't want him to leave either. The key, or Ethan. I choose Ethan for now. We walk to the edge of the pond, and he admires it. Not too many people have a pond in their backyard. I hadn't thought about it. We surely didn't have a pond in Boston. Ethan and I sit down opposite each other on a flat granite rock near the edge, and I appreciate the pond's beauty for the first time, seeing it through Ethan's eyes. Clusters of reeds shoot up like spiked anchors around the perimeter. On Mr. Bender's side, some coot hens swim in and out of view between the cattails. I hear frogs at night. I tell him, even in February, Lily thinks it's strange. Not so strange for here, he says. Are you from here? He hesitates, looks at me like I've just asked him to give me a pint of blood rather than asked him a simple question. His answer is just as odd. Yeah. It's not the word, but the way it is said, drawn out with a slight nod and a sigh. I recognize it from somewhere. Maybe I saw it on Jenna's face, or heard it in her voice on one of the video discs—a simple word that said more than was intended. Resignation. Enough. Stop. What do you want from me? Yeah. Things I think Mother never wanted me to see on those discs. Things that I think even the old Jenna never saw. Here is a problem for you, I say. That's why I go to the charter, he answers. A lot of people around here know me. It's easier there. Because you can hide. You put things together fast. No, not really. You said everyone has a reason for being at the charter. I was just waiting to hear yours. He leans forward. His arms resting on his knees. I spent a year in the state juvenile facility. I beat someone up. When I got out, I couldn't go back to the academy, so I went to the charter. You don't look the type, I say. The type who would beat someone up until he's more dead than alive. He looks past me, his eyes unfocused. I can hear the knot in his throat pulling tight. You just never know. I lean forward, my arms on my knees, so our positions are mirror images of each other. You never know. Ethan knows more about himself than he ever wanted to know, and I know less than I should. It seems wrong that his dark past should elevate my own blank one. His eyes are dark, full, as full as Dane's are empty. I come forward, so I'm on my knees. So close to his face, I should be embarrassed, but I'm not. Aren't you going to ask why? He says. I close the space between us, my lips on his, wondering if the old Jenna knew how to kiss, and if the new one remembers. But judging by the way his lips feel against mine, the answer to both of my questions is yes. I finally pull back. Sorry. I say, I should have asked. He pulls my face back to his and kisses me again, both of his hands soft against my cheeks. Our kisses grow heated, and everything that is curious and odd and funny and wrong about me disappears, and I'm no longer thinking about me, but everything about Ethan, because the warmth of Ethan, the scent of Ethan. The touch of Ethan is all about 
who I am now. And only when he pushes me away, because Lily is yelling in the distance for me to come back to the house, do I want to answer his question. I already know why. Because sometimes there's just no choice. Choice. I needed it like I needed air. But no one could hear me. No one could listen. No words. No sound. No voice. I couldn't even dream myself away. Choices were made. None of them mine. At first I wondered if it was hell. And then I knew it was. Message. I slam the kitchen drawer. It's not necessary to slam it. I already got the message that you're angry. I pull the drawer out and slam it again. I do it four more times. No! Now I think you got the message! It is time for your nutrients. Like you ever cared about that before! I pull the bottle of nutrients from the refrigerator and pour the measured amount into a glass. When I put the nutrient bottle back in the refrigerator, I grab a container of mustard. I squeeze half of its contents on top of my prescribed beige brew. I glare at Lily, daring her to stop me, and I swig it all down. There! Done! I slam the glass down on the counter, half expecting it to break. You shouldn't have done that. It might not go down well. She sighs like she's tired, and that makes me angrier. Why couldn't you just butt out like you always do? It's not right, Jenna. Says who? Says everything in the universe. I think he was enjoying it. For now, maybe. I want to cry. I want to sob loudly. I want to beat something, anything. I want to pound on her chest and say, please love me. I want that minute back when I was kissing Ethan, and now was all there was. I want someone in the world to answer why. Why me? And suddenly I feel weak, like every question in my head has collided against another and won't let me think. Now is the only word that comes out. And I know it makes no sense, but I say it again. Now. Lily's face wrinkles for a moment, and then I see her hands stiffen, and the stiffness travels all the way to her mouth. She stands there staring at me like I've just recited a speech instead of one simple word. It's better this way, she finally says, for Ethan and for you. She leaves and I hear her walk down the hallway to her room and close the door. And I wonder if she will even notice the downturned picture or her out-of-place shoes. Mustard and Kisses It is only half past twelve, and I'm already back in my room. My insides are shivery. I'm not sure if it's the half bottle of mustard I just swallowed or thinking about Ethan kissing me. I don't care if the mustard goes down well or not. It was worth watching Lily stand there helplessly. She knew she couldn't stop me, and the little click of power that ran through me did go down well. I scan my empty, no-personality room, and my gaze stops at my netbook. I should watch another year of Jenna, or learn more about my neighbors the way Mr. Bender does. I feel like I should be doing something else. Hurry, Jenna but instead I sit at my desk and lay my head down, wishing I could sleep and wake up a new me. Sleep doesn't come, neither does a new me. I stare at my awkward monster fingers and feel my clumsy, funny feet sliding back and forth on the floor beneath me, listening to the creaks and ticks of the house and the heaves and sighs of restoration. Jenna Fox Year 16. I place the last recorded disc of Jenna's life into the netbook. What is there left to learn? I have more holes than substance, but I've pieced together a girl, 
with the scatter of memories that have come back to me, and a life recorded beyond reason. I was treasured, adored, smothered with hopes. I was everything three babies could have been. I danced as hard as I could, studied as hard, played as hard, practiced as hard. I pushed to be everything they dreamed I could be. But with all the scenes, the birthdays, the lessons, the practices, the ordinary events that should have been left alone, what I remember most are Jenna's eyes, flickering, hesitation, an urgent trying. That's what I remember most from the discs, a desperation to stay on the pedestal. I see that in her eyes as much as I see their color. And now, in the passing of just a few weeks, I see things in faces I didn't see before. I see Jenna, smiling, laughing, chattering, and falling. When you're perfect, is there anywhere else to go? I ache for her like she's someone else. She is. I am not the perfect Jenna Fox anymore. Like all the previous discs, this one begins with her birthday party, a lavish private affair somewhere in Scotland. Mother, father, and I all wear kilts, and happy birthday is played by a legion of bagpipers. The disc moves on to a school outing on a schooner. I scan the faces, looking for Kara or Locke. A few faces are familiar. Schoolmates, I remember. But not my friends. Not the faces of my dreams. Where are they? Jenna's hair whips across her cheeks. She glances at the camera and for a moment becomes rigid, forcefully tilting her head sideways, silently pleading for space. Instead, the camera zooms in. I can almost see her cave. Surrender. And then suddenly she runs, weaving herself through the crowds of classmates, away, and the camera shuts off. Another scene begins. Jenna in pink tights, her hair pulled into a glittered bun. Give me a twirl, Jenna, father calls. Claire comes into the room. Got everything? Shoes? Costume? Yes, Jenna says. What about that makeup? Claire asks. A little overdone, don't you think? Jenna's eyes are heavy with eyeliner, dark smears that don't match her baby pink tights. What difference does it make? It might not please your ballet teacher. I don't care if I please her. I told you, this is my last performance. Claire smiles. Of course it's not your last. You love to dance, Jenna. Jenna grabs Claire by both shoulders and looks down at her. Look at me, mother. I'm five nine and still growing. I'm not prima ballerina material. But there are companies. Jenna throws her hands up. Why don't you be a ballerina? You're five foot seven, the perfect height. Go for it, Claire. I see Mother's face change, the hurt. I almost have to look away. Was that the first time I called her Claire? Ladies, Father says, and the camera shuts off. That's it, the last recording of pre-coma Jenna Fox, a small argument with voices barely raised. Why would Lily suggest that this was the most important disc to watch? What was her point? The last disc is a non-event, anticlimactic. Why did I think it would be something big? Or maybe she was just trying to save me hours of boredom? Cut to the end? See what a dickhead I was and get on with it? Move on. Maybe that's the something I feel, the something I should be doing. Moving on. I've hurt Claire. I know that. I remember trying to tell her how sorry I was, when my whole world was frozen and sorry couldn't get past my lips. Sorry for what? The accident? All the harsh ways I treated her? Sorry for calling her Claire when she only wanted to be called Mom? Maybe that's why Lily won't have much to do with me, because of everything I've put Claire through. Move on. The something I should be doing. Deep.
Claire walks through the front door just as I reach the last stair. Her arms are loaded with rings of fabric swatches and catalogs. Need some help, Mom? She is transformed. One simple word has wiped five years from her face. I always thought it was Claire who held all the power. I was wrong. I am taken with how beautiful she is, and feel shame that I have withheld a treasured word for so long. She sets her armful down on the hall table. I can get it, Jenna. Her voice is soft, my name sounding like a question mark. I step down from the last stair. We stare, our eyes on an even plane, like we're holding something carefully between us. Something. Suddenly, I feel dizzy, like I'm stumbling. Is this what moving on feels like? I back away. I can't do this. Something's not right. But I owe her. I know I owe her. My hands shake. My vision flashes. I try to steady myself. I shove my hands into my jeans. The key. It's still there. It is hot against my fingers. Do you mind then if I go for a walk? I've been inside all day. She hesitates, then nods. But don't go far, she says as she walks to the kitchen. When she's out of sight, I open the front door, then close it again loudly, so she will think that I left. I concentrate on my feet, trying to step as lightly as I can, and I creep down the hallway to her room. I will put the key back before she misses it. I begin to fold back the spread from the corner of the mattress, but a thought stops me. Hurry, Jenna. There might be time, if I hurry. I turn toward the closet and listen for sounds coming down the hallway. None. I pull the key from my pocket. It slides into the lock with a soft rasp, and I hear the tumbler turn. I ease the door open slowly, willing the old hinges not to squeak. The room is cold. Dark, barely illuminated with a faint green glow, I feel for a switch but can't find one. My eyes adjust quickly to the dim light, and I see the source of the hum. Computers, three of them. They sit on a narrow table in the small dark room. They are oddly shaped, each a six-inch square block, much larger than a home computer, and each is connected to its own battery dock. Why not just run them off house power? I step closer and I see a small white label on the middle one. Jenna Angeline Fox. I rub my hand across the label, soaking the name in through my skin. Jenna Angeline Fox. I should have asked long ago. It makes me feel whole. A beginning, an end, and a middle. Why is it that the unknown is always so frightening, Angeline? I close my eyes in the darkness and whisper the name. I feel my feet on the floor, my place in the world. I belong here. I deserve to be here. How can a middle name do all that? Are the details of our lives who we are, or is it owning those details that makes the difference? I open my eyes and examine my computer. I wonder what's on it: schoolwork, letters to friends. I feel a surge, like a jolt of energy has shot through me. History, my history. It should be in my room. I try to lift it from the table, but it's secured with a metal bracket. I work to pull it loose. One rivet pops out, but the rest stays secure. I pound at the bracket with the heel of my hand, throwing the full force of my weight behind it. But my hand slips and slices into the sharp edge. Pain rips up my hand, and I fall back. But just as quickly, the pain is gone. I hug my hand to my stomach, afraid to look. I know the slash is deep. If Mother had a meltdown over the tiny cut on my knee, I can't imagine what she'll do when she sees this one. A trickle of blood oozes through my fingers. I will have to retrieve my computer later. I step out of the closet, lock it, and hurry to my room, trying to slip silently upstairs. 
I go to my bathroom and lock the door behind me. How bad could it be? It was only a little piece of metal. I hold my hand over the sink to spare the floor, but thankfully the blood has already stopped flowing. A three-inch gash runs from the fleshy part of my thumb to my wrist. I'm surprised that it no longer hurts. Will I need stitches? I pull the flesh apart to see how deep the wound goes. It is deep. What? How? Oh my god! I can't think deep. Blue. The stairs rock, sway. I clutch my gashed hand to my stomach. The other gropes at the stair rail. Only a small smear of blood stains my shirt. So little, and it's barely red. Is it red at all? My feet stumble on the stairs, and I fall down three at a time. Jenna? A distant call from the kitchen. More stairs, and no pain. My hand doesn't hurt. The hallway rocks, and the doorway sways. Mother and Lily are framed in light at the kitchen table. They stop their conversation, stare at me. Mother focuses on my shirt, the blood stain. She begins to rise, but a single word from me stops her. When, Jenna, when were you going to tell me? I yell. I shove my hand out in front of me. What is this? Mother's hand comes to her chin, half covering her mouth. Jenna, let me explain. Lily rises. You should sit down, she says. She steps behind her own chair and offers it. I sit down because I don't know what else to do. I look up at Claire. What's wrong with my hand? I lay it on the table and spread the gash apart with my fingers. The skin lies on a thick layer of blue, blue gel. Beneath that is the silvery white glimmer of synthetic bone and ligaments, plastic. Metal composite. Mother looks away. What happened? I ask. My voice is a whisper. It was the accident, she says. The accident. Was it cut off? Mother reaches out. She lays both of her hands on my arm. Jenna, darling, tell me. It was burned, terribly burned. I look at my other hand resting on the table next to the gashed one, my other perfect hand, the perfect hand that won't lace right, the monster hand. I look at mother; she looks like she's crumbling inward, caving like a terrible weight is pressing on her. What about this one? I ask, raising my other hand. She nods. Oh my God. I look down, the world disappearing beyond the circle of my lap. I'm suddenly so cold. My skin that has never felt right instantly feels foreign. I hear Lily move to the other side of the table, the scraping of a chair, the sigh as she sits. It all pounds in my ears. My hands twitch. I look at them. Can I even call them my hands? I turn to mother. Is there anything else? The tears flow. Her face is desperate. Jenna, what difference does it make? You're still my daughter. That's all that matters. My clumsy feet, my legs. Oh God, no. Stand up, I say. I rise to my feet. Mother looks at me confused. Stand up! I yell. She stands inches from me. We look eye to eye. We are the exact same height. How tall are you, mother? I whisper each word distinctly, like a string of knots in a rope I am clinging to. Jenna? She doesn't understand. 
She doesn't know what I've seen. In the last video that Lily told me to watch where I blurt out my height, fear twists her face. She doesn't answer. How tall are you? I demand. Five seven. I collapse back into my chair, shaking my head. Mother is mumbling, rambling, saying something that is all noise for me. I finally force myself to look at her. Tell me everything. What? She says, pretending she doesn't understand what I'm asking. She does. I see it in her eyes, a frantic back step, hoping all this will go away. How much is me? Her lip trembles. Her eyes pull. Lily intervenes. Ten percent. Ten percent of your brain. That's all they could save. They should have let you die. I try to understand what she's saying. I watch her mouth move. I hear words. Ten percent. Ten percent. And then Mother is suddenly fierce. A lion within inches of my face. But it is the most important ten percent. Do you hear me? The most important.